Thank you very much. Welcome. Again, I'm Doug Cozy. I'm the superintendent of Bell Berkshire Creek Schools, and this is our levy community meeting. It's February 3rd, and it's, uh, we're going to go from 6 to 8 tonight. And we have a, con a contractor with the Date Mediation Center to facilitate this community meeting. So again, welcome to everybody. Um, we hope that there's going to be a uh, lot of good information tonight and Q&A also. So uh, from 6.05 to 7, once we get started here, David Graham, the county auditor, is going to do his presentation and then also on school tax, school tax collection and then have Q&A. And then uh, from 7 to 8, it's going to be uh, David Carpenter, board member, board president, and myself. Uh, we're going to do a, a levy information presentation, and then we're going to have a question and answer. So I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl here. She's going to go over, let me just forward this up here, the Q&A process. Go ahead. Thanks, Doug. Uh, so as you all can see up here on the screen, tonight's process is going to go like that. Uh, there will be there's no campaigning allowed on school grounds recording is being conducted by the district and will be posted on the district's website all questions should be submitted to us and if any of you have written questions down on the cards please get those to my partner up here dick at this table um, like now and um, then we will be going through the audience if anybody has any other questions only during the first hour. Um, we will consolidate any questions that are similar. We will answer questions that were submitted online first, and then questions from the uh, night of the meeting tonight, those will be answered next. David will allow for questions during the whole time that he's speaking. He has from six to seven, and he's just gonna be taking questions on the fly. I'll be coming to you with the mic so that you can ask those questions. Questions that were submitted online have already been uh, gotten by these guys, and so we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so uh, first, did everybody get a handout? Does anybody need one of these? Anybody bring your hand? Okay, so um, obviously I do not view myself as either being a proponent of or opponent of this or any other levy. That includes those levies in the town in which I live in. Um, I pretty well keep my mouth shut unless you're family. So um, you know, I, I know there's been some betrayal that, uh, hey, he's for it, he's against it. I'm neither. I'm here to provide information and hopefully let you the, the public make the decision as to whether you want to pass a levy or not. Um, the other thing that is a common occurrence when I do a property tax presentation is, David, do you have to go so deep into the weeds? And there's a certain level of getting into the weeds that we have to do. Um, unfortunately, uh, you, you have to understand some of the concepts um, that cause the numbers that we're going to be going through later. Hopefully, I've simplified it, and I know I've made it much shorter, so. Um, I do uh, encourage people to ask questions as we go along, um, because if you don't understand what's on page one, much like your algebra homework, when you get to page 10, you're not going to have a clue what we're talking about. So I, I am going to request that the uh, questions be about property taxes and the process. Um, I did a presentation uh, two weeks ago, and we got into zoning and everything else where I have no expertise and I can sit and listen to you debate it amongst yourselves, but it really doesn't get us anywhere. So. Um, first thing we're gonna talk about are the types of levies. So Inside Village is uh, the easiest of all the levies. Um, it's straightforward, traditional, what you would think of. If your value goes up 10%, your taxes go up 10% really is that simple and if all levies were this way, um, my job would be a lot easier in explaining property taxes. Um, there is a, a maximum of millage, of inside millage that's available to any taxing district. And so if you were to think about a taxing district, 
Um, I'll use L35 as an example to me. Uh, L35 is meaningful to most of you. It's okay, why that? It's the beginning of your parcel ID number if you live in Melbrook City. So L35 is a unique set of government agencies that tax a given area. So in this case, in L35, you have the county, uh, you have uh, Bellbrook Sugar Creek Schools, you have the Green County Career Center, you have Bellbrook City, uh, you have uh, Bellbrook Sugar Creek Park District. Um, I think that pretty well covers that. So those unique set of subdivisions can only have 10 mills among the, the, all of them. Now remember, your total tax rate is probably in the 70 something. We'll get through some of those numbers later, but so it's a small portion, about 11% of your total millage is tied up into inside millage. Um, the rate is never adjusted, and it doesn't matter why your value change, your taxes will go up, your values go up, but uh, the, the converse is also true. If values go down, your taxes will go down on that inside millage. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. We have fixed sum levies. The school district only has one fixed sum levy. It's a bond retirement levy. The other type of fixed sum levy that you'll hear about uh, periodically is an emergency levy. Um, these are levies that are voted to generate a specific amount of money. In the case of the school district, we set that bond rate every year so that it generates enough money for them to pay the principal and interest that the voters authorize them to go out and issue that, that debt. So that is, uh, it's unique because as values go up, the rate decreases so that it generates the same amount of money. Doesn't matter why the value changed, it's going to generate the same amount. And again, this makes up a relatively small portion of the school district's total uh, levies. Fixed rate levies, um, these are the most common. This is what you use for your police, your fire, um, most of the school's levies. This upcoming ballot issue is a fixed rate levy. And fixed rate levies are unique because why value changes matters. So in my world, values change for two reasons. I either reappraised it, by reappraising, I change the value on something though the characteristics of that property did not change. So if you have an open field and you split it, uh, 100 acres, you split it into 10 10 acre lots, I'm going to reappraise that property and that value is going to go up because land is worth more per acre the smaller it is. Um, and that is going to be a reappraisal change. It's still an open field. Nobody's put a house on it. So reappraisal change, and that's what we're going to be doing in tax year 2020, pay 2021. We're going to be reappraising every property in the county. Um, the other change is, of course, called a non-reappraisal change, but it's easier to think about it. If you think about a non-reappraisal change is new construction. The characteristics of the property change. Now, it's not limited to new construction. The tornado that went through Beaver Creek, all of the damage that was done, those were non-reappraisal changes. So here the key point is, is that if it's a reappraisal change, what happens is the effective tax rate of that levy is reduced. If, if a reappraisal increase occurs, the effective tax rate is reduced so that levy generates the same amount of money it did in the prior year. Everybody good with that? So your levy will always remain the same. And no, because we're going no, not necessarily. If the only reason values changed was because of a reappraisal, I would say yes, the answer would be yes. But new construction occurs every day. And that new construction is a non-reappraisal change. And that does result in additional revenue to the subdivisions, not just the school district. For the county levies, we get additional revenue when new construction occurs also. So everybody's good with the two types of value change and how they impact fixed rate levies. Okay, so um, the theory behind why fixed rate levies work this way, because it's the primary way governments are funded is through these fixed rate levies, is that if you think about it in terms of a fire department, if I come along and I reappraise your property and I increase it 30%, does it mean it costs 30% more money to come put a fire out at your place? Not necessarily. 
However, if you build a new subdivision and it causes a 3% increase in the total value for that fire district, it's going to cost more money to protect more people. So with those new construction, governments get more money. With reappraisal changes, they do not. Bear with me, I'm used to having a wider platform here. So. Um, the next slide is just a summary of what we just went over with the three types of levies. I'm not going to spend any time on it, just it's a quick reference guide for you as we're talking about other stuff. We'll go through some examples though. So in this case, we assume we have the three types of levies that we talked about. It's a five mil levy, and the total valuation for the subdivision is $35,000. You can make it 35 million, 35 million, whatever you want. I kept this number small, so they would all fit the little boxes there. So you can see that a five mil levy on $35,000 will generate $175 worth of income. Now, here we assume the same facts for all the cases. We have a reappraisal increase of 4%, a new construction increase of 2%, for a total valuation change of 6%. On the inside millage, just as I said, doesn't matter why the value changed, value went up, revenue went up by an equal percentage. Again, a small portion of your total tax liability. The fixed sum levies, you can see that the value still went up 6%, but what happened is the tax rate was reduced because they don't need more money than what that principal and interest on that bond is. So that one, the rate decreased. Doesn't matter why the value changed. Value goes up, rate goes down. Value goes down, rate goes up. That simple. And then we have the fixed rate levies, which are where the complexity comes in. So here you can see we had a 4% increase in our reappraisal due to a reappraisal. And if you look at what happened to the tax rate, it went down 4% because that levy was still trying to generate the same amount of revenue it did in the prior year. The change in taxes was a 2% increase. That ties directly to that new construction number. So the new construction increase of 2% in value caused a 2% increase in the revenue for that subdivision. Yes, sir? Did you say $35,000 assessed value, so that is the typical $100,000 free that is correct, but remember, we're not talking about this in terms of an individual taxpayer, because an individual taxpayer makes up one of many properties that go into determining what are the reappraisal changes, what are the new construction changes. So I probably should have used a different number to make it a little clearer. Yes, ma'am. If you look at an individual home, their house is reappraised for higher, and then they go Sort of. How's that for a good government answer? <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to get into where taxes are relative. Um, and that is probably a question when we get to that. If you still have questions, we can, we can discuss it then. Uh, because when you talk about an individual taxpayer, it's completely different. And I apologize. Her question was, on inside millage, this reappraisal will cause our taxes to increase. Yes. And then the question was on fixed sum and fixed rate levies, it would be a wash. And my answer was not necessarily. I'm wondering if it's important to everybody to hear everyone's question. So that, so heads are nodding yes. And so if you raise your hand when you have a question, I'll come over to you with the mic. What's going to be the average? I did an interview with her. I think most people have seen it. The average when I talk to you at the end, Average uh, reappraisal is going to go up by 12 to 13 percent. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe that's what the number is. It's covered in the slide here in a little bit. So, okay, so we're all good with the theory of property taxes, right? Or do we just not really <laughs> say, oh, he's just making this stuff up? There's no way it can be this complicated. Okay, so let's look at the makeup of Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District's levies. They have 4.5 mils of inside, which is dedicated purely to the general fund. 
and that makes up 11% of their total millage. Their fixed sum levy, which we already talked about as a bond retirement levy, um, that makes up again about 11%. 78% of their levies, which is their permanent improvement levy and a multitude of general fund levies, um, make up that remaining 78%. Okay, so again, this is why I wanted to go through the theory first and then point out what the makeup of their levies are so that you can kind of conceptualize. <laughs> Okay, here is a list of all of the value changes and property tax revenue changes for just their general fund. I excluded their bond retirement because it's not really relevant to this conversation. And I excluded permanent improvement just to save space because this slide is also already very busy and to add permanent improvement to it. So you can see um, the reappraisal changes that have occurred. Uh, everybody keeps telling me, well, property values never go down. That's not true during the recession. Property values were decreased. Um, we could argue whether they were decreased enough, but uh, they were decreased. Um, you can see the reappraisal numbers. So you can see reappraisal changes range from uh, half a percent to almost, well, to 2% uh, in new construction in a given year. And then you can see what their property tax revenues and the percentage changes they've seen in that. I, I highlight this, so the, the year where they had the 12.3% increase in general fund revenue, they replaced the 5.5 mil levy. I believe at that time it was collecting at about one mil, and so when they replace the levy, that effective rate comes back up to the voted rate, causing about a 4.5 mil increase. That's the reason you saw the large change there. Um, these are raw numbers. They include delinquency and they include a lot of other things that you might not otherwise include, but I thought it was important that you see that with the reappraisal change, so if you look at 2018, and I've indicated uh, when valuation updates are done with the asterisk, that in uh, 2018, when we had a 4.7% increase in the appraised value due to me reappraising the properties, that we only had a revenue increase of 1.1%. Okay. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. So you have the 1.1% on those properties. How do you do properties in a tax location on those feed into these numbers? Okay, so the question was how does new construction play in with this? Um, is that a good yes. summary of yeah. the question? Because there's been so much growth. And I will say, you guys are in a high growth area and you get additional revenue off of that new construction. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I have arguments with, I have arguments with other county auditors who say, no, that levy only generates what it was intended to generate when it was voted in. Not true. New construction is new money. You get additional money from that new construction, except for on the fixed sum levies, which is a small part. So let's ignore that. So you do get that new money, but you're in a high growth area. And look, your new construction, at given the years that I, I've selected here, um, was at a maximum of 2%. So while you do have a, a lot of new construction, when you compare that to a value of $500 million, it doesn't make up a large percentage change in your value. It's a lot of money that's being added, but relatively speaking, it's a small percentage. Okay. So what impact will this levy have on the district's general fund revenue? Um, if the levy were to pass, it would cause a 16% increase in their general fund revenue. Okay, it's a pretty straightforward slide, but no questions on that one? All right. Now for the important part, how will it impact your tax bill? That's the one everybody wants to know. So if this levy were to pass, and I, I told you I talk in taxing districts, so if I ever say L32 or L35, here's your key as to which one I'm talking about. Um, but Sugar Creek Township, if it passes, it would, I would expect that it's going to generate 8.3% increase in your tax bill. 
here in Bellbrook City, it would be an 8% increase in their tax bill. Again, not for or against, not saying the numbers are big or small or anything in between, just providing the information. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. Those figures on the increase doesn't include any of the other levies that have already passed or anything that's on the current ballot, correct? No, this is purely just this levy comparing it to the taxes for tax year 19, pay 20. So the current tax bill you have, this is what I would expect the increase to be. But the others would be added to this then. Yeah, if there were any additional levies that were voted in, they would be in addition to this. Okay, I have a question here. Am I understand then that with this new assessment, we might have a 13% increase, and then this would be an 8% on top of that, so it would be like a 21% increase altogether? No. No. So that's where, when we go back to, when we go back to this slide, remember, the inside millage moves in direct correlation to what your value change does. So on that inside millage, would it be a 13% increase? Yes, but that inside millage represents about 11, 12% of the total millage that you pay. The fixed sum and the fixed rate levies are all going to be rolled back, including this levy. If this levy were to pass, it would not go on the tax bills till tax year 20, pay 2021. It would be subject to a reduction immediately on that tax bill because when the school district asks my office to certify this levy, they say, I need X amount of money. That's what you guys are voting on, how that amount of money that they put before you. Yes, it's expressed in terms of mills and dollars per hundred, and we're working on legislation now that will hopefully make things a little clearer. Um, but, you know, so these levies, that's the reason you have to understand, 78%, well, 78 plus the 11, 89% of their levies are, from a reappraisal change, aren't going to get any additional revenue. 11% of them will. Yes, sir. So if I could just ask the same question a different way. If you're saying an 8.3% increase, and you're talking on uh, 12 to 13 percent increase. What does that actually amount to? Yeah. So we're going to go back to the, my delaying the relative tax question because I can't answer it for an individual taxpayer. Tax rates are set for the, at the subdivision level, not at the individual taxpayer's level. And because everybody's value doesn't change equally, I can't answer the question as to what impact will this have. All right, guys, uh, let me, while she's back there, I'm going to hit him and then I'm, I'll get to you. Okay, sir? One of the points that the school board is at now is that, and, and it's a false point, that uh, they weren't anticipating or didn't expect to get any additional revenue from the re, reappraisals. Um, and from my talk with you, the dollar amount uh, that you told me that they should expect an additional $832,000. Is that correct? That is not correct. So we, we will correct talk. Number. We will we will talk about that. Uh, I've got that on the slide as well. So if we can delay that. I have a gentleman up here who has a question. Um, right here. Let's do it this way. I'll save you some steps. Yeah, so the homestead exemption would continue to apply to this levy if it were passed. Okay, so um, if this levy passes, or any new levy passes, all levies that are passed continue to qualify for homestead. Now, uh, it's kind of a sidebar, and this is where I always get in trouble because I talk too much and go off point and I ask everybody else to stay on point. There's a bill in the legislature right now um, that would tie the homestead reduction. So right now it's $25,000. It's been that since uh, um, Governor Strickland uh, put it into place, uh, changing the homestead program. There's a, a bill out there that is going to try to tie that to the consumer price index 
so that as time goes along, your homestead reduction would go up. Um, so that, that's a bill that's uh, being debated right now in the House. Yes, ma'am. I'm a slow learner. Um, Me too. So as I look at this 16% here, just, are you referring to the percentage increase that would go to the general fund for the school district to be increased by 16% for no. the day? No, okay. their tax revenue. Tax revenue makes up one portion <coughs> of their general fund revenue. Um, another major portion is the school foundation. You know, I don't know their percentages. I'm not, I'm not educated enough to speak on what their revenues are. I will point out though, if anybody wants to see the financial statements for the school district, if you go to the Auditor of State's website, they have every audited financial statement for government entities out there. And you can look and see what their sources of revenue are. Okay, so this $20 million, $669,000, that's not the actual annual dollars going into the school district over and above their current stream. No, the twenty million six sixty nine one forty seven represents the property tax money that I sent to the school district during 2019, calendar year 2019. So it's only property taxes. It doesn't include any other revenue sources. And, and believe me, I enjoy the questions because I get tired of hearing myself talk up here as well. So one of the other issues that has come up is um, well, how do we stand relative to other school districts? Um, and so, unfortunately, when it comes to tax year 19, pay 20 data, the only data I have access to is Greene County. But every school district where Greene County is the primary or it overlaps into Greene County, this is the effective tax rate, how it's broke down, what's used for general fund, permanent improvement, emergency, bond retirement, and then I also indicate whether they have an income so um, one of the things I hear from taxpayers on a regular basis is why are Beaver Creek and Bellbrook property taxes so high? There's no income tax. So the entire tax burden for the school district and the municipality. Um, townships have no ability to levy an income tax, but for, for municipalities and school districts, that entire burden is borne by the property taxpayer. And anybody who's heard me give a speech before has heard me say property taxes are the most unfair of all taxes. That's because they're not based on what you can afford to pay, what you use. So a sales tax is based on what you purchase. Income tax is based on what you earn. This is based on the value of what you own. And it doesn't correlate to what you have the ability to pay. So that is, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, my primary jobs, I've got I think under statute, it's other duties as assigned, but my primary job is the chief fiscal officer and tax assessor for the county. Um, so, you know, the, this is uh, it's kind of what I do. So, the other, yes, sir. Right, then not as much an income tax as a wage tax. Not as much an income tax, yeah. Um, so, so I. Most, really most school districts. <laughs> Most school districts only tax earned income. Okay, so that means your pensions um, are not taxed. I live in a school district where the pensions are taxed, and my mother's not very happy about it. Okay, any questions? Like I said, my, my goal is to give you guys as much data so you can make informed decisions. Okay, what impact will the reappraisal? So we're gonna kind of jump ship from the talking about the new levy to talking about the reappraisal because I know in a lot of your minds, those two are somewhat correlated. So as we, I've said many times, the reappraisal will be a reappraisal increase and the inside millage, they will get additional revenue from it. And about 11% of their millage, for, um, <coughs> pardon me, is related to their, their inside village. Um, the fixed rate, um, 
the uh, rate will be adjusted so that it generates the same amount of money it did in the prior year, of course, getting growth from new construction. Um, so the school district will receive an increase in their revenue because of the rate increase. I'm not trying to hide that. Um, it's, we'll go through some other numbers where we can point out the, the different scenarios. Uh, what impact will it have on the individual taxpayers? This is the one everybody wants to know about. Um, the inside millage, uh, of course, will cost you more, and the fixed rate levies. Um, it's real hard to answer that question, and we're going to go through a relative tax example. So remember, I said tax rates are set at the subdivision level, and regardless of you know what you think your value should increase. I think most people in the Millbrook Sugar Creek area would agree that your value, per, your percentage increase in value would be larger than that that occurs in Bowersville. So, City of Zenian, City of Fairborn. Though we'll have areas of City of Fairborn that will also see double digit increases in their property value. So, because everybody's value doesn't change by an equal percentage, we end up with this scenario here where we have two owners. We'll pretend they're, it's a county levy. You only have two property owners in Green County. Each of them have an equal value of $35,000, and there's a two mil levy that's passed that generates $140 a year. I come along and do my statutory duty. I reappraise these properties, and I determine that owner A gets a 14% increase in his property value, and owner B gets a 6% increase in his property value. Now, this, this example only works for fixed rate and fixed sum levy, so keep that in mind. Um, so our new values are no longer equal. Now you can see we set the tax rate, we have a reduction factor and an effective tax rate now at 1.8 mills. Still generate $140, but look at what ended up happening. Owner A saw a 4% increase in his taxes and owner B saw a 4% decrease. This is why this question is really hard when people say, what will this value change have, what the impact this value change will have on my taxes. If your value goes up by less than the average for that subdivision, so if county, you're talking county-wide levies. Uh, city of Melbrook levies, you're talking about people who live in taxing district L35. So all of these factors, and, and I'm, it's one of those I always say, it's not impossible to calculate, but it would probably take me two or three hours to do it, and I don't have that much time to invest in each of you that are here, let alone each of the people that are in the county. So, you know, taxes are relative because you have to generate a specific dollar amount, and your share of that dollar amount is based on your value, your percentage of that total value. I see some perplexed looks, so I'm encouraging questions. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if I understand your, your previous slide correctly, the schools will already get an increase even without the lot levy, primarily due to the reappraisal, correct? Yes. Okay, that's one. And we don't know how much that is individually, but there is something. Well, we're going to go through a scenario where it might help kind of point it out. And so the other piece is, and I, which came as a surprise, that every subdivision has a different tax, or you assess based upon the subdivision and based upon the value of your home within that subdivision, down at that level? No, tax rates are impacted by the change in value within that subdivision. I'm sorry? Hey. Subdivision, like is it? Okay, okay, so in this case, I'm talking about a subdivision being each of the political units that are taxing you. Going back to L35, the county, the city, the school district, the first subdivision. No. No. Going back to your other chart where you compared the two houses for the 235 and 35. So to simplify this, would you kind of go with the idea that maybe if you look at three people sharing an apartment and you've got a master bedroom and you've got two smaller bedrooms and the total rent for the apartment is $1,000. And whoever's in the master bedroom 
page 400, and the two smaller bedrooms both say 300. Then after a reappraisal, it'd be more like they swap rooms, maybe. So one person moves over to the $400 bedroom, one person moves down to the $300 bedroom, and then one person's rent doesn't change. So they're still paying $1,000 in rent, but the way it's distributed shifts around a bit. Yes, you're still trying to generate, in, the, in that example, you're still generating $140. It's just instead of the two people sharing that liability equally, now one person owns 59 or 51 percent of the total value, and the other person owns 49 percent. And if they own 51 percent of the value, they own 51 percent of that liability. Can you explain a little bit how you were saying countywide values were likely to go up, I think you said 12 to 13 percent, or that is specific to the Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District area. Okay. Countywide, I have not looked at any numbers on that massive of a level yet. Okay, and then for this example though, even within Bellbrook Sugar Creek schools where values would go up that much, there will be pockets where it goes up a little less over here and a little more over there. It's not uniform, and that's what creates that kind of example. Exactly. So, so my brother lives off of South Linda. Does anybody think that those properties are going to be comparable to a brand new subdivision of five hundred thousand dollars and up houses? You know, they, they just they don't correlate together. They're two completely different markets, and their values will move in different ways. Okay, so how much will values increase? Oh, we have another question. Oh, sorry. I just want to add on this last slide, relative example. So. Really, the, the taxes that you're generating, they did not change. Right, because I assumed the only valuation change was a reappraisal. There was right. new, no, new no construction. New, so the school district does not get any benefit. They do not. Even though one person's paying more tax and one person's you're, paying less. You're just, the total you're just, stays just the redistributing where who's paying how much tax. Right. I used to call it the theory of relativity, but people said that even property taxes aren't that complicated. All right, so how much uh, will values increase? Ran a sales ratio report looking at sales that have occurred uh, through December 31st of 2019, and we were at 83%. Uh, now, state orders, well, the state constitution requires that I appraise properties at their fair market value, which is 100%. However, we use a statistical model in valuing, and we're not going to get into our valuation process a whole lot here. I'll be happy to, to talk about it in a, a different setting uh, because that's not what we're here to talk about. But it's a statistical model that we use to come up with our appraised value. So if I shoot for 100% of the value using a statistical model, I will have just as many people over appraised as under appraised. Those of you who feel you are over appraised, you yell at me. So I prefer not to get yelled at, and so I shoot for about 95%. Quite honestly, the State Department of Taxation expects us to be at 95% of those sales values. So that's how we got to where our sales ratio is at 83, and I'm expecting a 12% increase to get us to that 95. Okay. Then I also gave you some of the value, some of the other. Uh, Things, but remember, just because we're talking about a 12% value increase does not mean your taxes will go up 12%. So, uh, when Mr. Stafford and I met, I built this model, and, and I built the model to because I like playing with Excel, I guess. Um, but what I did is I assumed that there was a 3% increase in new construction. Now that's probably a little higher than what we would expect. And I assume there was a 12% increase uh, in ag res values because of the reappraisal and a 10% increase in commercial and industrial properties because of the reappraisal. The results of that model 
indicated that the school district would get an additional $848,000 from that model. Now that's a 4% increase. Remember, 3% of that increase is directly related to the assumption I made that new construction would be equal to 3%. So if instead I were to assume there was zero new construction, which is also not a valid, there's going to be new construction. But if I assume there was a 0% in new construction, then tax revenue would go up 1% or $212,000. So you can see that by you know, building this model and making educated guesses, and quite honestly, when I built the model, the goal wasn't to say, here's how much the revenues are going to go up. It was to say, here's how this process works through. And um, so if, if anybody said, uh, David said, tax revenues are going to go up $848,000. I did, but I did it through a model that I didn't have any heavy reliance on. It was more to prove the point that even though values can go up in a reappraisal by 12%, revenue doesn't go up by 12%. That, that was the goal of that model. So what's next? Well, I always tell everybody I have until March 31st to submit my tentative abstract. And I tell them that because I hire an appraisal company to do my reappraisals. And I want them to live and die by that March 31st deadline. So our goal um, would be that we are going to submit our abstract shortly after March 31st. Um, hopefully everything is smooth in that. Um, then after we do that, we have to encode all of the new construction and update our current agricultural use values. And so all of these are things that have to be done in a process. Now, just because I want to submit my abstract by April 1st, doesn't mean the Department of Taxation is going to turn it around in a week. My goal is, is if I submit it earlier, they will react quicker and I can get good data faster. But I am relying on the Department of Taxation. So in August, everyone should receive a letter from my office telling you, here's what the value of your property is based on this reappraisal. If you have questions on the accuracy of this number, contact our office. Do not contact us and ask us what the tax implications are going to be because we're still not going to know. But we will be ready to discuss values. And like I said, we use a mass appraisal approach. It's a statistical model to value in your property. And I will say that model works well 99% of the time. 1% of 76,000 parcels is still a lot of people to talk to. But we encourage that. Um, so you know, once you get that letter, we're, we're going to have a bunch of tools on our website that will assist you in determining whether your value is reasonable. Um, but, and then the last week of December, usually the week of Christmas, uh, the Department of Taxation sends me the certified tax rates. And at that point, I know to a dollar what your taxes are going to be. So we we'll talked a little bit about resources. Um, I have a ton of information on our website. Um, we have the auditor's real estate page. I have a white paper that explains property taxes. Um, and I wrote it, but somebody rewrote it so it makes sense. Um, we have a list of all the levies that are up, going to be on the upcoming ballot. Um, what they'll cost you per $100,000 of the value and then what the levy will generate revenue, how long the uh, levy will be on the books. Um, and then on Green Online, we have our property search. I encourage people to go out and look at the property search. That's where we have your property data. If I have bad data, if I have wrong square footage, then if I, have, if I don't have a finished basement or I do have a finished basement that's no longer finished, this is stuff that we rely on you because I don't get inside your property. And you know your property better than I do. So I encourage you, look at the data. It, uh, that site has the distribution of your taxes, levy by levy, which where every dollar of your taxes go. Have your historical taxes, what they were you know, 15 years ago. You can look and see what the taxes on that parcel were 15 years ago. Um, and if you're filling out your income taxes, we also have the payments that you have made or that have been made. So instead of calling my office and saying, hey, I need my uh, property taxes that I paid in 2019, can you give that to me? Go to our website. 
so we are going to be um, on Green Online. We also have our levy estimator, which instead of basing it on $100,000, tells you levy by levy, or levy by levy, tells you individually what that levy will cost you, including any owner occupancy credit, non business credit, or homestead that may be on there. So you know, if you don't know what this new levy is going to cost you, go to our website, the levy estimator, bring up your property. It will tell you, and again, it's going to be within a dollar. Different systems round different ways, but we should be within a dollar. Um, and then we're developing a value add analysis dashboard that will actually, when you bring up your property, will allow you to see sales of properties in your neighborhood. Again, you know your property better than I do. I know everybody I ever talk to, they live in the smallest, cheapest house in their neighborhood, and it's really not comparable to anybody else's. <laughs> So, uh, but these are things that we, we, that's what we look at. If you come into my office, first thing I'm going to do is bring up our website and look at sales and say, how's your property compared to this one? How's it compared to that one? Uh, there are many times people walk out of my office. I'm like, here, you need to file this BOR complaint. Um, I'm one member of a three-member board that decides this, but I don't know how we got to that value. So I encourage you. It, it's your right. Okay, so we did receive some questions ahead of time. Um, do I need to read the questions or can everybody read them? Can I just summarize them? So, uh, are school districts tax revenues capped? No. Uh, there is no cap per se. Uh, remember, fixed rate levies, fixed sum levies, the tax rate is adjusted so that it generates the same amount of money. Uh, but new construction says there is no cap. And the school district, if you go back to that slide earlier where we had all the tax revenues by year, you can see that number has grown over time. Okay. And the other thing I want to point out with those fixed rate levies, because everybody's looking at value increases now, but the converse is true. If values go down, that effective tax rate will increase so that it generates the same amount of money. The only caveat to that is the uh, effective rate can never be more than the bonus. So I think the only time I've really seen that happen is uh, Montgomery County has a countywide human services that, that they just passed right before the recession. It was supposed to generate, I'm going to make up the money the numbers because I don't know what they were, but supposed to generate $20 million and because the market collapse was generating $16 million, leaving them a $4 million shortfall that they actually came back to the voters and asked for additional money. Um, what is the current average appraised value for a home in this district? So I don't deal in averages. I, this is the benefit of being an accountant. Not only are you a nerd and very particular, but you don't talk in generalities. So I did a calculation. I said, okay, so if I take the total appraised value of all residential property and divide it by the number of parcels, textbook, that would tell me that's the average value. So that average value in Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District worked out to be $89,000. Does anybody think that is right? Me neither. Um, so the reason it isn't right is you may own three parcels. One of them has your house on it. You consider that one piece of property. But I look at it as three separate parcels. It has three separate legal descriptions. I tax each of those parcels separately. So where you had one house that was appraised at $100,000, and I took those three parcels and said, yeah, but it's only worth 33, on average, of $33,000. Um, that's, that's bad math. So I, I don't get involved in the averages. Dayton Board of Realtors will sometimes uh, release numbers on average house prices. I'm not sure what data they use to get it, but even the Dayton Daily News has asked me about that before, and I just don't track it because I deal in each individual parcel what we think of property combined. Uh, my understanding is the city will get approximately 21% of the real estate per year. Uh, what percentage of real estate goes to the school district? So I actually broke it down. For tax year 19, pay 20. You can see the two taxing districts, um, Sugar Creek Township and Melbrook City, and where that money goes. Now, I do always throw in a little caveat. Remember, county doesn't mean county general fund. It includes library, 
uh, children's services, developmental disabilities, it, it includes all the county-wide levies. So keep that in mind when you, know, you go, wow, why does the county get 17 uh, percent? I heard that our taxes are really high here. I've heard taxes are really high everywhere. Um, at least in Greene County. I don't know if Carl has the same problem in Montgomery or not. Does he? Can you talk to him about that? Um, but how do our taxes compare with other districts in Greene County and around us? So I tried to pull some surrounding county information and, and it's because you know, these are questions that came to me at about 12 o'clock. I didn't have as much time to invest in the research as I would have liked. Um, but remember, property taxes represent one component of the tax base. In the county's case, we get a sales tax. And in the city's cases, many of them have income taxes. But here they are. So what I did was I took our most populous areas uh, within the township, and this is the total effective tax rate for each of those areas. So I did exclude the village of Clifton um, because I ran out of room and not many people live in the village of Clifton. Even though it's a village, I don't think you can call it pockets. So again, information you guys have access to um, this reason that I hope everybody got us out that wanted one. And then these were some of the areas in Montgomery County that I was able to pull. Um, and you can see what their effective tax rates are. And with that, I am done, but I agree. We have a couple of other questions. Okay. And I see some hands raised too. So I'll go ahead and ask these, and if they're not your questions, then I'll come over to you. Um, why couldn't we wait until after the reevaluation of property taxes is complete? to see exactly what the schools get before placing a levy on the ballot? I would say that would be a great question for Dr. Cosette and not for me, I did not putting the levy on the ballot. And another one is, what do you estimate the decrease in property value might be when a community doesn't invest in its schools? People, parents, want their children in good schools with high ratings, Cutting services will cut property values. Is it? It's proven history. Um, I don't accept that as proven history. What I'm going to say, and, and I've had the converse argument made that if property taxes get too high, then you're going to drive property values down. Ultimately, here's what I'm going to tell you: I measure what has happened, not what's going to happen. So when I'm doing this reappraisal that we're working on right now, we're looking at sales that occurred from January 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2019. I'm not trying to project what will happen in 2020. Now, am I looking, still looking at 2020 sales? Yeah, because I mean, I was here when we had the recession in 2007, collect 2000, you know, 2007, yeah, collect eight was our valuation update year, and the market was collapsing in the third quarter of 20, 2007 and our sales didn't reflect that because our sales were based on uh, the two and a half years prior because when the market collapsed if anybody remembers it wasn't that we knew sales were going down it was that there were no sales because money was dried up so um, I, I can't I can't predict what that, that's I, I'll get the question occasionally somebody moves in or wants to start talking about putting a landfill in. Well, they can't put a landfill in here. They'll destroy my property values. It's been proven that property values go down 20% when a landfill comes in. I've never seen it, so I don't know that. So There were a couple of other hands up. There's one all the way in the back. <coughs> Would it be safe to say that you have to have a house maybe $300,000 such that the additional revenue balances out with the additional expense? Say two kids in school, police, and fire. We're going to lose that additional revenue without the additional expense. Well, obviously, um, residential new construction, I mean, the, I'm probably going a little off course here, um, it costs money. Um, commercial new construction costs money, not so much because because you know, it has a higher demand for services also because you have more people coming to that area. I, I don't look at the expense side of things. What I am is an expert at maybe 
maybe not explaining property taxes, but knowing about property taxes. And so that's purely my focus. I don't look at the expense side and say, well, here's the size subdivision, here's the value of a house you would have to have in order for that to hit the break even point. Never done any type of analysis like that. Could you just clarify, you said that Bellbrook City and Beaver Creek City do not have income tax? That is correct. Neither the municipality or the school district in either of those areas. I live in the city of Xenia, grew up there. We have income taxes for both our school district and our municipality. So other school districts benefit from income tax and we don't because we don't have them. That is correct. The problem that I have on the chart that you're using is you're trying to justify bad decisions of other districts at the tax rate they're charging to bolster the argument that we should also make bad decisions in what we're charging for our property taxes. And I think it's a bad argument. I think that we as Bellbrook Sugar Bridge should decide whether we want to be taxed at the same rate as everyone else. I agree. I agree with that. The voters should decide. I had an interview with Dr. Kozak. Dr. Kozak said that our taxes weren't too high in that if you were paying high property taxes, it was because you were in an expensive house. I think these are loser arguments that are being made to justify us paying this property tax. So when I see this and you say, oh, Beaver Creek's paying this and Centerville's paying that, my response is I don't care what they're paying. I live in Bellbrook Sugar Bridge. This is not a question. But this slide was put together at the last minute to address a specific question that was asked. I'm not trying to sway anybody. I go back to that is not my intention. I'm providing data. I wish I could have found Warren County's tax rates because I would also consider them to be a similar area of yours. I couldn't find them in time to get it on the presentation. Yes, sir. I know you saw it through the calculations, but you said the average property tax value was about 12%. Do you have an idea based on previous re-evaluations what that curve looks like? So I understand that the property tax for each individual person will go up or down based on the relative increase of their property compared to the average. So if the average is going to be 12%, would you expect 90% of people's increase to be between 8% and 14%? Or 10% and 14%? I think that's too tight. I really do think that is too tight of a scale when you look at the differences in the housing stock that we're talking about. We're talking about everything from a late 1800s farmhouse to a $2 million house that's new construction. So when we talk about the breadth of that percentage, it could be significant. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions on this side of the room? I've got a gentleman over here, and then we need to stop and continue with the second part. I probably don't need the microphone. I like that voice. If you would go back to the current area school district effective tax rates for a minute. I'm going to have to grab the slide show. It was page 6 in the handout if anybody's following along. So on that fixed rate on a general fund, you gave a presentation back in April, maybe March. Is that the sum of the various levies that the voters have approved over the last 10, 15 years? That 31? Okay, so I'm sorry, and I'm confused by your question. Well, where does the 31 come from up there on your fixed rate? So the fixed rate, those are the levies that are in place for tax year 18, pay 19, and it's a summation of all of the voted levies for Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District really from the beginning of time. But we would have started tracking it in 1976 because that's when House Bill 920 passed. And then just for point, Kettering also doesn't show the income tax. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Is that it? Do you have finishing comments? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
No, I appreciate your time and I appreciate your questions especially. I did this presentation for a group of county auditors. You would have thought I was boring them senseless. At least you guys were engaged and I appreciate that. Thank you. So the next half that goes to 8 o'clock is going to be um, conducted by Dr. Kozat and Mr. Carpenter. And they're going to get started. This part will not take questions from the audience, so I'm hoping if you had any questions, you've written them on the cards and you've gotten them up here to my partner, Deb. Yeah, so there's, there's a bit of a presentation here, so we're going to go through that and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, again, thanks to David Graham. I'm not sure where he's going to go to somewhere. Oh, he's out there, okay. Thanks to him for his presentation, a lot of great information that, that he always provides. Um, again, just to, so this is the financial update, levy information. Again, um, our, one of our, our main reasons for having a meeting like this tonight and another one that we'll have on February 17th is to make sure that everybody has all the information that they that they need and so just to give you some background here um, as you see as you see on here here's some background information about our budget situation so um, summer of 2018 we had about five hundred thousand dollars in budget reductions May of 2019, we had a 7.5 mil replacement levy on the ballot and that failed. And then in June 2019, we had phase one of budget reductions. That was $813,000. We looked for some additional reductions in summer of 2019 that had another $168,000 in reductions. Also during the summer in July, we worked collaboratively with the state auditor's office on a performance audit and we presented that information and the auditors were here last Thursday. We're going to go through some of that information again tonight because it's really important information. helps paint the whole picture. Um, also during the summer there we did a statistically reliable survey and part of that survey was um, don't come back asking for more money unless you, unless you have some reductions. And so, hence the, the reductions that we, we have been doing. And we did not put a levy on the 2019 November ballot. We just didn't think there was enough time between May and then to really get the information that we needed out to everybody for everybody to make an informed decision. Also, November 2019, phase two reductions, that's a million dollars. Um, and then, so if you look at all those total budget reductions, that is $2.3 million in budget reductions, and a million of that from November 2019 is a 0% pay freeze for everybody in the district for next school year. Um, but it's also elimination of 20 staff positions, 10 of them certified. So um, those are our uh, uh, various positions around the district. So again, that that is that's the kind of the mode that unfortunately we have been in uh, since then. And like I said, we're at a critical juncture here. We have outstanding dedicated teachers in the school district, outstanding support staff um, that really do an educate or a fantastic job of educating and supporting our students. As you know, we're consistently ranked um, among the best in the area, among the best in the state, and among the best in the nation. But right now, as you can tell, the single most important factor that's facing our district is our budget. And so a piece of that, the major piece of that is in the November 2019 five-year forecast. So uh, if you look at the, the bottom right-hand side of that, that's $11.6 million deficit that we're looking at in, in fiscal year 24. So that's school year 23-24. And um, 
next school year, 2021, we're at 1.2 million in the black, but then the next school year there, 21, 22, we were at $1.8 million in the red. And so that this is what really draw, drove the auditors. So the auditors um, came in. Let's keep, we'll, we'll go into that in a second. So another piece to look at this is days cash on hand. So the and this was in the, the audit that the uh, it's really recommended best practice to have about three million dollars cash on hand. That's about 60 days cash on hand. So right now we're at that. That's the minimum you should have. And we're already, that's our maximum. We're going to continue to go down, down, and down. You can see that as we're dropping down underneath that. And so that really brings us to uh, why we have issue nine on the ballot for March 17th. It's a 5.7 mil operating levy. Um, the district last passed a levy in 2015. Again, this is for the day-to-day -day operations of the school district, staffing, utilities, maintenance, supplies, transportation. So that is where this money is going for. It's going for operating expenses. Um, we only received 27% of funding of our funding from the state. And the, the, uh, they have a complicated funding formula, but it's, it's essentially based on property wealth within a community. So it's inversely. So the higher the property wealth within a district, the school district receives less money from the state and conversely. So like I said, we've already made $2.3 million in budget reductions. And the cost of this per $100,000 house is about $16.60, about $199 per $100,000 per year, and about $0.55 cents a day per $100,000. So various ways of looking at that. So other facts about that, the levy is going to raise about $3.3 million a year starting in January 2021. So even if we pass this levy in March, we don't receive any money until next calendar year. Okay. Other pieces of why this levy is necessary, unfunded or underfunded, I really should say unfunded or underfunded mandates. So those are things that the state and the feds tell us that we have to do and they don't fund us at 100 percent of that level or they don't fund us at all for it and just last year it was 3.6 million dollars the previous year was three million dollars just in that one year so um, some examples of that are uh, gifted services english as a second language services special ed uh, preschool college credit plus so again, for example, College Credit Plus, it is when high school students are able to uh, get college credit and it's free to the parents and to the kid, but it is not free to the school district. The school district pays that. And that was about $92,000 last year that the school district paid colleges for College Credit Plus. And a lot of those classes, we teach them here. So we provide the, we provide the room, we provide the teacher, we do all the teaching and the college gets the money for that and they just provide the transcript it's transcripted credit so again great thing for kids great thing for families financially but it is the k-12 school districts that are paying for that and we have no choice in that the state tells us we have to do that we can't say no to them we have to do that um, additional money from new construction so this involves reappraisals inside millage and cornerstone. So we we receive we do receive extra money from that. And that's about two percent of our budget that we receive from that. But that is already in the five-year forecast. So as you see those increases, we're already accounting for about a two percent increase in those um, on a yearly basis. That money is already in our five-year forecast. Another piece to look at. And again, this was in the auditor's report. That is, again, online. It's on our website. It's on the Ohio auditor's website. You can go and, and find and download, download the whole thing. So local tax effort comparison. So what this does is this looks at a community, not the school district, a community, community's property wealth and income, and then sees what taxes they actually are paying. So this is a, a community's tax burden. 
relative to their property wealth and relative to their income. And so um, our tax burden compared to these other school districts around the center of Beaver Creek, Kettering, Wayne, Xenia, our tax burden is lower compared to those other communities. Um, and actually, Centerville and Beaver Creek passed a levy last year, so theirs is going to be even um, higher. So again, our tax burden, this is something that the auditors did, not something the school district did. The auditors looked at this. The tax burden relative to property tax, property wealth, I'm sorry, property wealth income compared to the taxes they're actually paying, and our tax burden is lower relative to those things compared to Xenia, where their income level is lower, their property wealth is lower relative to the taxes being paid. This was actually in the bridge from last year, spring of 2019. So we took this from Beaver Creek, City of Beaver Creek, <clears throat> area tax cost. So if you look at, this is per $100,000, per, per $100,000 house, and per $50,000 income. So these are all apples to apples comparisons. And so on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you see the real estate, real estate tax is paid. City income tax or township tax, school district income tax, and then what the total tax bill is per $100,000 per $50,000 income. So as you see there, Sir Creek Township and Bellbrook are lower compared to those other school districts, or other cities. So like an Oakwood city is almost twice as much as us per $100,000 per $50,000 house. Or, I'm sorry, per $50,000 income. Okay. So let's look at the five-year forecast with the levy passage. So again, we'll raise about $3.3 million a year at the end of our five-year forecast. We're still going to be in the red or just right at zero. So we understand that there is still work to be done even if we pass a levy. We still have work to do. We understand that. So um, we will continue to look for cost savings to do even if the levy passes. Again, I know that uh, another piece is people have asked, will you bring back the things that you've already reduced or cut? If you look at this, we really can't do that because if we do that, then those numbers, get, that number gets even bigger in the FY24. So that's school year 23-24. Just a little information about the performance audit. Um, again, why did they come in and do a performance audit for us? because they looked at our May uh, 2019 forecast, because of the 2019 May levy failure. So that those two things can combine, they conducted this performance audit for us. Um, and so what did they find? They, they saw that we were already taking proactive measures. We already knew that there was a financial situation going on, and that's why, that, remember from that first slide there, all those things that we were already reducing and cutting because of that. They identified 11 areas, and these recommendations would not fully resolve the deficit. Again, they can't assume a levy passage. So their sole focus is their $11.5 million in the, the deficit in the five years. What do we, what can we cut within the school district to get to that without a levy passage? Now we obviously can pass a levy, but they can't assume that in their auditor's report. So through those 11 measures, and we're gonna go through them in just a minute here, they couldn't find enough cost savings to, to get rid of that $11.5 million deficit. So they essentially uh, had another recommendation 12, which would drastically change the service levels within the school district. So it would change the student experience if we did that recommendation 12. So some further information. Again, they're unbiased third party, um, very similar to, to Auditor Graham over there. They, they don't care whether a levy passes or not. They're, that's not what they're there for. They're there to uh, look at everything and to provide information. They've been here, or they were here since July. So we've been, we've been working with them from July until just uh, December here, and then the report was just published a couple weeks ago. So they looked at um, financial management practices, human resources, facilities, transportation, and food service. So they took a look at everything that we that we were doing 
And this normally costs eighty thousand dollars, but since the, we were in that financial situation, it was free to the district, so it didn't cost us anything for this uh, performance audit. And so they looked at comparisons, peer districts, which are districts around the state that are similar to us financially and also academically, and local districts, and then state. You gotta remember, all the recommendations there are non-binding, so we can do all of them, we can do none of them, or we can pick and choose what we want to do within that report. Again, like I said earlier, there's no assumption of the levy passing within the five-year forecast. Like I said, they found that because of our lean budget already, they found it extremely difficult to find areas to reduce. That's why they had to have that recommendation number 12, which is kind of a um, uh, catch-all, kind of a nuclear option, for lack of a better term there. Um, of, of a catch-all. So they found that, like I said, service levels will change, the, the student experience will change if all those things are implemented like they recommend in there. Again, we'll begin to implement some of the recommendations, others will be looked at more long-term. So I'm not going to go through all these level recommendations like we did at the meeting the other night. Um, again, all this is online on our website, Ohio Auditor's Office. So one of the recommendations is um, Direct, or, uh, eliminating the subsidy of extracurriculars at sports clubs, um, any type of extracurricular activities, eliminate that subsidy. So the general fund is paying for those things. So normally, they would just suggest to the school district, recommend, get down to your peer districts, get down to that level. And we're about $40 higher than those peer districts. That's what they normally recommend. Since they couldn't find other areas to cut, they are saying eliminate the subsidy completely. And so if we eliminated that subsidy completely just through pay to play, all right, not other ways, not by reducing sports or activities, but just through pay to play, based on last year's numbers of students, it would be $1,000, $1,200 per kid for, per sport if we um, implemented it or implemented that recommendation just through pay to play. Um, another one here is that's, that's 700,000, 325,000 of eliminating a 0.5 career tech teacher, a one counselor, 1.5 nurses, and 0.5 library staffing. Um, and again, that's their recommendation for this particular piece. But they do not take into account, they do all everything by 1,000 students, per 1,000 students. So they don't take into consideration um, building configuration. So sometimes, you know, if you have a six to 12 building, you may be able to get away with one less nurse or one less counselor because they're all in the same building. But um, since we're in four different buildings, it'd be much more challenging to be able to do that. And the last recommendation here um, is recommendation 12, like I said earlier. So uh, again, this is either uh, reducing, so in addition to those five staff members or so, five FTEs in the other portion, this would be an so a few options here, they, they would say eliminate 16 more teaching positions. Uh, in addition to that, so that's about 20 teaching positions or 20 staff members, or 10.5% staffing reduction in the entire district, or extend the pay freeze a little longer, three more years. Um, but even with the pay freeze, there's already a pay freeze for next year, so that couldn't happen until the year after. You still have to reduce another six to $700,000 worth of worth of staffing reductions because it wouldn't be enough. So equally important here, those are the recommendations they had. Equally important are the recommendations they didn't have because they looked at everything. So here are the recommendations they didn't have. They didn't have any recommendations for salaries. And we'll go to that in the next slide here. Medical insurance, transportation, staffing and maintenance, custodial, administrative, general education teachers, K-8 specialist teachers, building clerical and food, food service. <laughs> They didn't have any recommendations because we were right along with our, our peer districts with those. And we've already begun to work on a bus fleet replacement strategies, facilities, preventive, preventive maintenance plan, multi-year capital plan, and formal purchasing services. So talking about the salary comparison review, so this is how our salaries compared to local school districts or our local peers. Um, so they didn't look at a moment in time of what's your average teacher salary? Because our average um, uh, length of stay uh, is much longer than other school districts. 
So they look at your entire salary schedule, compare the salary schedule to other school districts. And how does the entire salary schedule compare to other school districts? So except, except in one category, BA 150, we were lower than all of our other peers. Again, it's important to compare to peer, or I'm sorry, local districts because you aren't competing with teachers or staff members from Toledo or Cleveland or Columbus. You're competing with staff members around this area trying to, to hire them. But even, we, if, even if we did all of the recommendations, so $2.5 million next year and $3 million the next three years, we still would only have $309 left in fiscal year 24. So even if we did all of that and changed the service levels drastically within the school district, we still would be out of money in FY24, even with all those drastic measures. Um, within the audit, there is a letter from me, so there is a, a you have an opportunity for a response letter. We're covering a lot of those major points in the presentation tonight. Another piece, and this is what um, ODE, Ohio Department of Education, we are in fiscal precaution, and so that is due to us, like I said earlier, we are $1.8 million in the red, not next fiscal year, the fiscal year after that. And so they want us to create a plan and provide that plan to them. Provide that plan to them by March 31st. So we have to have a plan to them how we're going to reduce our expenditures by $1.8 million by the end of fiscal year. 21-22. Uh, so, as I said the other day, there will be reductions if the, large, uh, the March levy fails. We're going, to re we're going to announce those no later than February 19th. We've been working hard on what those reductions will look like um, and, and trying to, again, they are uh, very heart-wrenching and very difficult decisions. Um, and they're not easy decisions as uh, having three graduates of the school system and my own son still in the school system, you know, those things strike um, at you personally also. Um, so, uh, like I said earlier, phase three, regardless of the levy passage, there's going to be reductions regardless of levy passage because um, we are still in a tough financial situation at the end of the five-year forecast. So if you make some reductions, for example, if you make a, I'll just use small numbers here, if you make a $50 reduction this year, that $50 reduction is, there's another $50, same $50 reduction you get the year after that, and the same $50 reduction you get the year after that, and the same $50. So you get $200 worth of reductions based on that $50 reduction you did the first year, right? That cumulative effect, where if you wait two years, to get to two hundred dollars, and you have to do a hundred dollars reductions and a hundred dollars reductions. So it's much more drastic. So the sooner you start on something of reducing, the smaller the reduction can be because it accumulates over time. So that's why if we do some re reductions anyways, um, it will it will accumulate over the next four years, and that number at the end of the five-year forecast um, will not be you know right at zero there. It could be you know depending on what those reductions are. And then obviously, excuse me, phase four reductions if the levy fails. So again, there, there, there needs to be reductions because first of all, ODE is asking us for our plan. What is our plan for reductions? Our first plan is, you know, you have to have plan A and plan B. Plan A is pass the levy march. Then plan B is, you have to have a plan on what those reductions be if it doesn't pass. So um, they are asking for those things. Staff reductions. Obviously, if you have staff reductions, they equal less staff. And I think sometimes people forget that um, staff members are behind all these great programs that we are offering to our students. So if you have less, less staff, you're going to have less programs to offer to your students. And those less programs will be less opportunities for our students. And that will be a less rounded educational experience for our students. And so, again, these pictures were taken off of Facebook, so don't read in it. Don't read into anything of what these pictures are. All right, but the, the main piece is, like I said, 
there's people, kids, staff members behind all of these reductions. So we can sit here, we talked all about numbers tonight, but behind all of those things are kids, staff members, community. So there, there's names and faces and opportunities. If you, were, if you think back to your high school, middle school career, no offense to English language arts, math, science, or social studies teachers, right? But a lot of your experiences from um, your high school are those things that make a well-rounded educational experience. Those electives, those extracurricular kind of things. Those are really the memories a lot of times that we have of uh, well-rounded, what a great experience we had in school district. And again, as you get, um, as you have to make reductions, those are the things on the fringe out there, on the extras, that maybe we can't offer some of those extra things anymore because you have to have the core. So that's the challenge right now. So what can you do? Again, read the performance audit. Um, get actively involved. I, again, I appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, I really do. And we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna have questions here in just a second. But we have another meeting on February 17th. We have a call through the superintendent on wine. Is this one at wine? Is this one's in the evening because the other ones have been in the morning? Um, and then you can check out our website for more information. And on our website, there's a communications tab that has the bridge on there, coffee chats, uh, quality profile, which is our center of year review. And then there's a lot of levy information on there, factual levy information. That is all on our website. All right, that's uh, all the presentation. We're going to go to questions now. Let me just, just put that right here. We'll come over to you. questions don't, uh, aren't uh, directed at either one of you, so we'll just call them out and you can answer them the way you want to. So the first one is, um, why couldn't we wait until after the evaluation of property taxes is complete to see exactly what the schools get before placing a levy on the map? Well, the, um, the need is current as compared to waiting for another year because when uh, this, if we were waiting until the end of 20 uh, in order to determine ex you know, precise amounts then we would lose another year of opportunity for being able to fund the school so that would be you know, as it is we're 3.3 million dollars behind where we hope to be this year uh, another year makes it 3.3 million dollars more in cuts than we would have to make so you're trying to stay ahead of that right exactly thank you but David, when would we know what the how much money we would get additional? When would we know that amount? I mean, before I would certify anything that I would put my name on, I mean, we could conjecture and I could build a model, but we would probably be looking at uh, December. So we wouldn't know for sure until December how much money we would get from reappraisal this next December, it's around there. But, but between uh, late October and December. So we would already be halfway into a fiscal year, the next fiscal year, um, and um, that would we would already, like David said, we'd already lose another year of funding because that would be past the November time. So we really wouldn't know what that amount would be. And again, we we really obviously want to know that exact amount and be able to, you know, sign your name to that's what the amount is. Um, we want we wouldn't want to guess on what that amount. Is would want to be, what could be. Again, I, Kevin Liming, our treasurer, was also supposed to be here this evening. He is ill with the flu, so 
um, he, he's, he was planning on being here, all, being here also. It's better if he's not here. Yes. <laughs> For all of us. Okay, the next question is, can the cost of building additional schools that are the result of new development be funded by an in environmental fee of X percent of the cost of the new construction? Funds would be escrowed into capital improvement. I'm going to go a different direction with that. Um, there, there is, there is no immediate need for new buildings. So, I, I mean, I, I guess at some point in the future, if there's a need for new building, we can take a look at that. But you know, we did a study two years ago. Not we, the state did a study. They came in and did a, a study, and they're projecting 250 additional kids over the next 10 years. So that's 25 kids a year. So from last year to, from Two years ago to last year, we had about 120 additional kids. Last year to this year, we were about break even. We didn't have any additional kids. So even though you're seeing quite a bit of building out there, it doesn't always equate to additional students. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but with even that being said, we still have room in our buildings. We still have room in our buildings we would have to have a pretty substantial growth before we would even consider you know, going back to the voters for some type of, of additional tax. But that is, that is not anywhere in our thought process at this point of going back for, for building new buildings. Um, we also still own the downtown building, Sugar Creek Elementary, the three-story and the one-story. The one-story we ran out to the uh, Green County ASC. We could always take that back. The uh, Board of Education office, the preschool is in there, and our central office is in there. We could do something different with that. So we, we still have space in our, in our school district for additional students. What is the average base teacher salary, and what are the totals? What is the total salary with benefits? What is the average base salary? And total salary with benefits. It's a good question. Yeah, I, I don't know the average base salary. Our, uh, our starters about thirty nine, forty, somewhere in that range. And the salary schedule is available. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> average Sorry, base. Yeah, you asked the question. Yeah, <laughs> the um, teacher salary schedule is available. Uh, public information. So at 34, 39, 40, 000. 39 to 40,000 for a starting teacher. And then it, it goes up based on your education and years of experience and, and time. And experience. Again, like, like I showed in the um, slide there, our salary scale is lower compared to other local peer districts, except for a BA that's bachelor's 150 column. So there's different columns for different levels of experience. So we pay less than local districts around us, and that was from the state auditor's report. Okay. And it will actually be less next year because all staff, including teachers, took a pay freeze and no steps for next year. So it will be even lower next year. Okay, next question. Will you please address the point made in the recent Dayton Daily News article on January 22nd, that the Bellbrook School District spends more than surrounding peer school districts in certain areas. Is there any detail on what areas? That from the auditor's report, I mean, we pay more. So I guess if you looked at an extracurricular subsidy, our subsidy, we subsidize extracurriculars more than our peer, our primary peers. And so primary peers are, um, so the districts around us that you would know would be Monroe, Ross, Tip City, but then there's, there's seven or eight other ones around the state that you, you probably don't know. Canfield, I think, is one. Um, so there's other ones out there. But we, we have about, uh, two, we pay about 260, dollars per pupil out of the general fund for extracurriculars. Our primary peers pay $222 per pupil. 
and our local peers pay $134. So we're almost twice as much as some of our local peers of subsidizing our extracurriculars. Um, so that means we're paying a lot less. Um, our, our, I guess our parents are getting a good deal on those, um, but we're, we're subsidizing those too much out of the general fund. I'm not sure if that's that's what that was. And I don't know if the person who wrote the question wants to clarify. Staff right here. Yes. What, is, what is the date? Um, that was the 27th of January. So which one? What is she? What is it talking about, Jeremy? Oh. oh. Okay. So this the staffing levels. So they compared us to primary peer districts. That's in the local ones are Monroe, Ross, Tip City. So what they're saying per 100,000 students that we have 0.5 career tech. More, 0.5 more career tech teachers. We have one counselor more. We have 0.5 more library staff, and we have 1.5 more nursing staff compared to those other school districts per 1,000 students. So again, like I was mentioning earlier, sometimes this configuration of buildings can either be a positive or negative on those and really can impact what your number is. Again, some of those are, are uh, critical, you know, the, the huge mental health push, and appropriately so, around the state, um, you know, and the the medical needs of students in our schools is, 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 is extremely high compared to what it's been in the past. So when we talk about, you know, reduction of counselors or nursing staff, those, those are some critical areas that we really need to take a look at and make sure that those are what's best for our our community just again like I said these are all non-binding recommendations just because that's what it says in here doesn't mean that's what's best for us sometimes it might be better to have uh, an additional counselor or 1.5 additional nurses or something um, correct so that and that was that was a total of 3.5 persons and so the other, like I mentioned in the presentation, the things that there were no recommendations for are equally important. There weren't any recommendations for salary, medical insurance, transportation, staffing and maintenance custodial. Actually, in maintenance custodial, when you look at maintenance, custodial staffing grounds, we're about eight to 10 people lower than the primary peers. So those people are working their tails off and we have great looking facilities. Um, and administrative, general ed teachers, K-8 specialist teachers, building, clerical, and food service, those are all areas where they looked at and said, we don't have a recommendation because you're right where you need to be with those. And the, but that's why they had that catch-all at the end of, you're right where you need to be in all those. However, that still doesn't eliminate your deficit at the end, so you need to eliminate your, our recommendation eliminates 16 additional teachers. Why? Because that gets them to that $11.5 million into the five year. Not because we're overstaffed to that, but it's, like I said, it's just a, okay, there's not enough money to cut here. Again, out of the $2.5 million they wanna, they're recommending for us to cut next school year, um, 700,000 of that is that direct subsidy, and then 1.4 million is those 16 teachers so those two drastic things make up 2.1 of the 2.5 million dollars so a lot 
Okay. Um, can you confirm that the five-year forecast already budgets for increases from inside millage and new construction, and thus the budget shortfall already includes assuming we get that money? The inside, uh, I think yes. Mr. Graham said yes. That, uh, but, well, I mean, the five-year forecast. So the five, yeah, the five-year forecast. We have uh, allowed, yep. allowed for that already uh, for the reappraisal based on the inside numbers. So yeah, so uh, again, I want to speak for Mr. Lining, but about two percent of our, so he's saying about two percent um, of the reappraisal, new construction, cornerstone. Mr. Lining has put those in the five-year forecast already. So yes, that is accurate. Does every student receive a Chromebook? And if so, what is the cost to taxpayers per year? So grades six to 12, everybody has one. Um, grades K to five, it's more uh, classroom-based or um, you know, every student has access to one, but they don't take it home, obviously, in K to five. Um, six to 12, we uh, charge a $50 usage fee each year for six to 12. So those Chromebooks are probably three, 350, the cost of those um, per Chromebook. And again, oh, maybe a little lower than that, okay. Maybe about 250, $300 per Chromebook. Um, but when you think of that, you know, on Black Friday, I can get one for $100, right? $75, I get a Chromebook. Well, but that's for personal use. It doesn't have to last three to four to five years of a teenager lugging it back and forth to school, um, maybe not being as, as nice as they need to be with it. So it needs to be a little sturdier on it. It's got to have security software on there also. Um, so um, that's actually one of the recommendations in the audit is they want us to push back the purchase of Chromebooks for a year to save an additional $250,000. So that, that's a delayed, you know, that's delaying a purchase, it's really not doing away with it. Um, but that means that some of those Chromebooks will be pushing five to six years old. Um, so they'll be, they'll be fairly old at that point. Um, but, and they'll be almost, um, at some point Google says, okay, we're done supporting them at that point. They, they push that date back. So, I mean, we can do that if we need to. Um, but again, the reliability and, and so forth of those Chromebooks will be a challenge. Okay, um, does the proposed pay freeze include certified staff step increases? Yes, steps. Um, so it, for, it is for all staff, it's for classifies for STIRB certifieds for administrators, it's for exempt staff, which is central office staff. Everybody has to pay freeze and no steps. What benefits do taxpayers pay for school employees and what percentage? What benefits? I guess. So again, health insurance, we're 80 health insurance. Um, again, the medical insurance is one of the things that the auditors looked at. Um, and so um, that was one of the things that we were right along with other school districts. Also, yeah, no medical recommendations for medical insurance. We also pay 14% uh, uh, STRS for them, a state teacher's retirement system. They also pay that amount, so they match that. So that's part of the school employees package and so it's fun part of the benefits and then part-time employees would be appropriately proportioned out for that you have mentioned that the auditor's recommendations aren't mandatory what method do you use to decide if a recommendation is taken or to decide on options um you know that's that's the real challenge here because and what's really going to drive is the the $1.8 million deficit that we're facing, not next fiscal year, the fiscal year after that. So that is what is really driving our decision making at this point, not the $11.5 million deficit that the auditors are saying we have in five years, and that would be $2.5 million next year and $3 million a year after that. Um, but that is a real challenge because when you look at, you know, if we're gonna, there's gonna be reductions, which are, uh, will be at the, 
the levy doesn't pass. Those are real hard decisions because what I may want to stay is somebody else's, they want it to go. Or you know, if you have to pick which one you want, it's, it's what, whichever one doesn't impact me or my child, that's what I want to be reduced by. So again, trying our best to stay out of the classroom as much as possible and try to as much as possible protect the core. Um, so those things are, are gonna be driving our decision making. Um, um, also making sure that it's, it's kind of well-rounded reductions also. Um, but those, those are real difficult decisions to make because everything is important. That's why we, that's why we have it right now, it's important. If we, if we didn't have it right now, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be important. Um, it'd be easy to cut, you know, if it wasn't important. So those are real challenges um, to have to, to go through that filtering process of, um, it, it's just, just really hard decision making. Again, like I said, I have a, my own child in the school district and those are tough decisions. You know, I know that the transportation was not a popular reduction in, in for this school year, um, but what you, when you think of what has the least amount of impact on the classroom, getting to school has a, you know, the, the right to school, whether it's that or a reduction in a teacher, the right to school has less of an impact on than that particular teacher or so forth. So um, trying to think of it, things like that, and that wouldn't, wasn't very popular. However, um, it, it's a hard decision to make. It really is. They're not easy decisions. Well, we've asked, that from a board perspective, we've asked the administration to, you know, comb through all the different options uh, and make some recommendations to the board, um, which uh, then the board will have to determine, you know, what, whether we go ahead with all of them or, or what that be. So, um, but. You know, it's a it's a process where the administrators have reviewed all the items, kind of fine tooth comb through them, and they'll come back with a recommendation to the board. Okay, so gentlemen, this is the last question. And audience, it's my understanding that they have agreed to stay after if you want to approach them with individual questions. Is that correct? So the last question is, do taxpayers pay into school employee pensions? And if so, what percentage or amount? Part yeah, part of the benefits package is 14% for teachers as TRS. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, sorry. State Educational teacher. acronyms here, sorry, I apologize. State teacher retirement system, sorry. That's our retirement system for educators. We have alphabet soup if you're in the industry, you know, you have your own particular um, verbiage. I'm sorry? Um, yes, it is. I like the Social Security. And actually, you know, can you repeat the question? We didn't hear back. Is that mandated? They're paying to the retirement system. Again, they've, they've changed the retirement system uh, uh, when you can retire. So up until um, four or five, six years ago, um, teachers or staff could retire at 30 years, get full benefits at any age. They have now stair-stepped it in where uh, certified staff have to work to age 60 and have at least 35 years in before they have full eligibility in the retirement system. So. That, along with the number of smaller number of people going into education, um, that really leads to a sub shortage that we have because a lot of times your your newer teachers are subbing, and then your teachers that have already retired, they're doing some subbing also. So it's really impacted our our subbing, not just us, everybody around here, um, everybody. Um, so, but there has been changes to STRS. So you and, we to have to, and we have to pay in more was was 12 percent 10 12 percent they've increased that and then they decrease how much we're getting so work longer pay in more get less doesn't sound really good um no but that's what because people are living longer 
And so they, they use those actuary tables, they, they know that, and so they make you work longer, so because people are living a long time after that, so you know, they, they're paying in, they're paying in, they, what they've paid in their whole career is less than what they're getting in their retirement, which is similar to Social Security. You know, Social Security, you probably have gotten all your money back, you paid into Social Security over your first couple of years, and after that, it's all the people that are working that are actually paying for your Social Security get to that point. So you're starting taking questions from the audience. I don't know if that's something you want to continue doing or we'll do it for a couple minutes here if you want to so you're going to take if you want to with microphone if that'd be all right. necessarily want to uh, go through the same scenario as uh, for like what GM had to go through and so forth. That's, it's, if we don't, if, if we can avoid doing that, we would certainly want to avoid doing that. Well, the, the other piece is that, you know, so at the end of the five years we'll be in the same situation. That's why we're also making a look at making reductions next year whether the levy passes or not so we aren't in that situation so try to build up that that savings through the next four years are built into the five-year forecast. So yes, that does assume that. Yeah. This gentleman, I think, had a question. Who funds the deficit? Who funds the deficit? Well, that's, that's why we're at now. So either you either have to A, make reductions, or B, raise additional revenue through taxes. So we're $1.8 million in the red two fiscal years from now. So you have to make enough reductions so that you aren't in the red because you can't operate in the school, a school district in the red. So if we do get to that point, the state will come in and, and uh, be very uh, friendly and hand-holding of making our budget. So they'll be telling us much more on a scale of what our budgets are. But they'll also say, get back on the ballot. You can't just um, not go on back on the ballot but if we are down a certain amount, they're going to make you borrow from the next fiscal year. So that means that puts you in deeper in the hole the next fiscal year. It's kind of like a payday loan. I'm not sure about interest. In, I, I'm not sure about the interest in fees, but but possibly. But they're going to make you borrow from your next fiscal year amount. So you're deeper in the hole that next year. The school board keeps on making the same argument that Dave Grimm made by using other districts' bad decisions to justify our bad decisions as far as 
wages or where we are to say, oh, well, we're great, we're not anywhere less or more than the other districts. But the other districts are also in financial trouble. Now, part of the problem that I have is you said we're going to maybe get rid of 16 teachers. But what you haven't told everybody is you're going to get rid of the 16 teachers that are the least expensive, not the teachers that are making the most. Uh, the only way out of this situation, because I firmly believe this levy is going to fail. We don't fit into campaigning here. We're not campaigning. I'm giving an opinion that that we have to cap and cut what's going on. The idea that that people are unwilling to reduce wages or their benefits. What's your question? 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 So people want to know if you have a question. Is this why are we not reducing the wages or the benefits? It's, it's interesting that since I'm the only one that talks, uh, when I talk, I'm the only one that gets interrupted by the oh, yes crowd within this group. You, that's not part of the question. So I understand we're stopping at eight. So you got two minutes. You want to? So the um, the question is assuming that it is a bad decision, but the, from the other districts. But in order to staff, you have a certain pool of employees available to you. And you look around uh, at your local peers and say, OK, if we're going to compete for talent to teach in our schools, you know, this is the pool we need to work with. And we need to be competitive you know, uh, with uh, the, the, what's available in the market. So if you want to send all your good teachers away, um, you, know, you, cut, you can cut pay. And then they'll go on to other districts, and then you're hiring all new. Now, I'm not against new teachers, but you need to have a good balanced mix of experience uh, within your district, so that you have, you know, uh, people who can mentor newer teachers. You can't have a, a, a school full of new teachers uh, and expect to have high quality education. Do you want to take this last question? One last question. We have about 40% um, of our staff, about 54 of our certified staff, and about 30% of our licensed staff live within the school district. Yeah, they will. Yep. Okay, gentlemen, right. thank you. All right, thank you very much.